Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Even as the apocalypse erupted inside the darkness of the shafts near a shed called the prayer hall, some hoped the primal energy would end the age of war. Weapons of peace, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee would call the nuclear bombs detonated at Pokhran in the summer of 1998. Less than six months later though, Pakistani troops had occupied the heights of Kargil. Confident India would not be able to respond with full-scale war. Terrorist violence surged, ending with India and Pakistan mobilizing their armies. Far from ending the danger from neighbors who had already unleashed four wars and two murderous insurgencies, scholar Ramesh Thakur has noted, Pokhran opened the door to a new era of what he calls lasting insecurity. Earlier this week, India tested its first long-range Agni-5, equipped with multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs. In essence, these are small nuclear warheads that can be released from a single missile at different speeds and in different directions over hundreds of kilometers apart. The technology has been designed, among other things, to overwhelm anti-ballistic missile defenses and optimize the use of expensive long-range missiles. This technological achievement is part of the long march India has made to secure its nuclear deterrence since 1988. But as strategic weapons experts Hans Christensen and Matt Corda note, it also shows new perils are emerging. The introduction of MIRVs during the Cold War forced both superpowers to develop enormous stockpiles of warheads, threatening the mutual deterrence that kept them from war. So the question arises, are MIRVs going to really end the era of endless insecurity that we entered? Even at the dawn of the MIRV age, questions were being raised about the strategic rationale of this technology. In 1976, Lawrence Livermore laboratory scientist Daniel Rukonet produced a classified history which sought to understand the Soviet decision-making driving its acquisition of MIRVs. Rukonet decided to go about this by re-examining the United States' own trajectory and decision-making. The US and China, the document noted, did not possess an extensive anti-ballistic missile or ABM defenses which raised questions about just why the Soviet Union thought it necessary to obtain MIRVs in the first place. From early in the Cold War, scientists in both the US and the USSR had begun considering how to protect themselves from intercontinental ballistic missiles. In 1962-1963, the Soviet Union began constructing an ABM system to protect Moscow which envisaged firing nuclear-armed Galosh interceptor missiles at incoming warheads. Each Galosh warhead had a yield of several megatons, that's hundreds of times the size of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. Like the similar safeguard system in the US though, the Soviet ABM system suffered from several major limitations. The doghouse, the name of the giant radar responsible for tracking incoming missiles, could be deceived by countermeasures like chaff. The radar could also be blinded by nuclear explosions, including obviously the detonation of the galosh itself. And it could deal with only six to eight incoming missiles at a time, far too small a number by 1962. To planners in the United States, the rise of ABM systems made equipping its arsenal with MIRVs very attractive though. Arming each missile with multiple warheads would make it easier to overwhelm the Soviet interceptors. MIRVs were also quite cheap. Former Ford Motors President Robert McNamara, who became the United States Defense Secretary in 1961, demanded economic efficiency. A nuclear warhead was one-sixth the cost of a ballistic missile, 
So obviously, if you could put more warheads on a single missile, you'd save a lot of money. Even though this argument was attractive, it didn't impress everybody. The United States Air Force, for example, argued that the smaller warheads in MIRV missiles would be ineffective against the kinds of hardened targets that it needed to attack. And then there was the obvious factor that if you had less missiles, the opposite side could knock out your arsenal in a first strike that much more easily. So some in the strategic community perceived that the MIRVs would deter the Soviet Union from pursuing its ABM program since it would be no use. Others anticipated that the more likely response would be for the Soviets to produce more and more warheads. From 1967 strategic affairs expert Silky Kaur records, the number of warheads in the United States arsenal surged with individual missiles like the Peacekeeper MX-10 carrying up to 10 warheads each. The United States land-based intercontinental ballistic missile force in 1990 was reported to be made up of 2,450 warheads on 1,000 missiles and its submarine forces of 5,216 warheads on around 600 missiles. The superpowers ended up signing the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972, which led both sides to commit to the protection of just one site with no more than 100 interceptor missiles. This was obviously a means to ensure that there would be some strategic parity in their arsenals and thus stability would be ensured. In 2002 though, the United States withdrew from the treaty to pursue its sophisticated anti-ballistic missile program. The decision, however, spurred Russia and China to begin the development of increasingly sophisticated missiles designed to punch through ABM defenses and also expanded the size of their arsenals. Exactly as scholars like William Potter had predicted decades earlier, the rising tide of MIRVs ended up undermining strategic stability, that is, the ability of the superpowers to ensure mutually assured destruction, which deterred either side from going to war. Technologists, Potter had predicted, would, and I quote, probably come up with more complex, more expensive, and more volatile defenses. The result, put simply, would be a pointless arms race. And that's exactly what happened. The US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, had argued against a ban or restriction on MIRVs in 1969. I would say in retrospect, he ruefully admitted five years later, that I wish I had thought through the implications of a merved world more thoughtfully in 1969 and 1970 than I did. The regret came too late. Little imagination is needed to understand the context that has driven India's pursuit of mervs. Even though China does not have a significant ABM capability as yet, it has conducted several successful tests of ballistic missile interceptors since at least 2010. It remains unclear how much progress China has made on other elements of a deployable ABM system, like space-based early warning satellites and high-resolution tracking radar. However, China's relentless pursuit of ABM technology since the mid-1980s obviously constitutes a threat to India's deterrent posture, if missiles India launches don't get through, obviously it isn't a deterrent anymore. Together with MIRVs, the use of decoy warheads, maneuvering warheads and stealth technologies all offer means to ensure India's strategic deterrent against China remains robust, while keeping costs manageable. In a thoughtful essay, scholars Rajesh Bashrur and Jagannath Sankaran Note that the case for Indian MIRVs is not as self-evident as it might seem though. For one, they argue, it is improbable China would be able to overwhelm India's military in a future conventional war, at least in a way that posed an existential threat to the country. Any future war will be fought in mountain terrain, where rapid advances will be quite difficult. This is in 1962. India's strategic establishment, they suggest, needs to carefully think through what kinds of nuclear deterrent capability it needs rather than draw on Cold War nuclear theology and simply merv for the sake of it. 
For China too, there are serious questions to be answered. The country resisted the introduction of multiple warheads to its Dongfeng 5 missiles for over two decades, nuclear weapons scholar Jeffrey Lewis wrote. Finally, among riding strategic tensions with the United States, China announced it had mated its Dongfeng 5 with multiple warheads in 2015. The decision was linked to worries over the United States' increasingly sophisticated ABM capacities. Little reason though exists to think MIRVs will give China or India the strategic security they crave. In the past, increased nuclear capabilities through MIRVing resulted in an accelerated arms competition rather than increased confidence in deterrence, Basrur and Jagannathan observe. The accumulation of warheads by their adversaries will make it ever more tempting for leaders in both countries to reach for the nuclear trigger first during a crisis. That's dangerous. Like the men who fought the Cold War, successive Prime Ministers of India and Pakistan have also stood on the edge of war many times since 1998. But they shied away from the prospect of mutual annihilation. There is an enormous gulf former US National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy wrote in 1967 between what political leaders really think about nuclear weapons and what is assumed in complex calculations of relative advantage in simulated strategic warfare. Bundy went on to say that, and I quote, in the real world of real political leaders, whether here or in the Soviet Union, a decision that would bring even one hydrogen bomb on one city of one zone would be recognized in advance as a catastrophic blunder. Ten bombs on ten cities would be a disaster beyond history, he added. Locked in a three-way co strategic competition, China, India and Pakistan are already in the middle of a nuclear landscape far more complex than the one that confronted the superpowers during the Cold War. Fueling the instability is the new Cold War looming between the United States and China. The outcomes of this four-way game of blindfold chess are impossible to predict. But this much is probably certain. Technology isn't going to offer solutions to this particular competition. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor at The Print. Thank you again for watching Security Code.